Okay, everyone, we're going to kick off our session on CETA. Um, welcome to everybody that's in the room and welcome to everyone that's joining us online as well. And this is uh, just an informal discussion really on the historic Supreme Court decision um, on basically CETA. We're just going to have a chat here with Deputy Patrick Costello. Um, we've got Dominic and Angus from his legal team, normally just known as the legal team. We have them here to discuss it. And I'm Councillor Lord Scott, I'll be chairing the session. We'll just start off with just a few a couple of questions just to get a background to the case and what it's all about. And then um, I'd be really like to just open up to questions from the floor and just hear what people want to know because it is a complex issue without a doubt. And um, maybe. Patrick, if we could start with you, just as a starting point, could we just get, make a bit of a distinction, I suppose, between the trade elements of CETA um, and the investor courts aspect, which needs ratification at the moment, yeah. and I suppose what led you to go into the steps of bringing the case to the Supreme, Supreme Court? Okay, so just on that first point, so CETA is a mixed agreement. This means it has bits of trade elements, um, you know, rules around tariffs, imports, exports, and then on the other side, it contains these investor courts. Um, it, the European Union has said, member states, if it contains investor courts, it must be ratified by the member states, because usually trade is handled at the European level. So. The, el the trade elements, the rules around imports, exports, tariffs, all around that, they're already in place. They were put in place provisionally very quickly. So we're benefiting from them already. So now it's the slow uh, bit of the ratification around the investor courts. So I kind of had two big concerns. Um, one was about how we ratify the treaty, and the other is should we ratify the treaty. One is a legal question, one is a policy question. So the how we should ratify was the, the, the bit we were arguing about in the courts. So for me, the big thing was we were creating these new courts, and I'm sure the guys can give me a bit more information, but we were creating new courts. And when we created the Court of Appeal, we had a referendum. When we created the International Children, um, excuse me, Criminal Court, we had a, re a referendum. Uh, the government had said, we'll need a referendum on the Unified Patent Court. We need a refer needed a referendum on the Courts Justice European Union. So I was sitting there going, why is it we don't need a referendum here? How are they getting around across? And that's when I picked up the phone to these this pair um, and started asking them the legal questions. And you know, that's kind of where it all began. That's, and then we, we've ended up then with, is it a 500 page judgment? Is that correct? Yeah, is it possible seven, so there was to seven. summarize that for us non-legal people? Yeah, well, I suppose we were challenging two elements of the investor uh, protection. So there's the investor protection rules themselves, which are the rules which say you have to treat foreign investors, in this case, Canadian investors, with fair and equitable treatment, and you can't expropriate their assets without compensation. Now, now both those sound very reasonable, but the, the real problem arises because, firstly, because those uh, rules aren't interpreted as they would be under Irish law. They're quite different. And there's compensation payable in far more cases than there would be under Irish law. And then probably what our real focus from the start was the investor court system, whereby Canadian investors, if they're not happy with an Irish law or Irish government decision, or even a decision of the Irish courts, they can go and challenge that in this separate system of the CETA tribunal. And what an important aspect of that is that the Cedar Tribunal can actually order a court process to stop in Ireland to, to put a hold to the effect of Irish law. So we were challenging those two things. And it was, I think Judge Hogan said in his judgment that it was one of the most important cases in the 100 year history. I was quite surprised by that because from, a, from an Irish constitutional point of view, because I thought it was so obviously unconstitutional. Um, that it actually wasn't that tricky a question to answer, but um, <laughs> but actually they, they they so there was in the end we had a split decision and we won on the investor court page, um, and what uh, so I'm, I've actually got a couple of quotes from the judges there, um, so Miss Justice Dunn said that the, it was the real difference between. The uh, CETA tribunal and say the ECHR was the automatic enforcement of awards in the Irish courts. So you can't, the Irish courts couldn't look at a CETA decision and say, no, we're not going to enforce that. They they're under CETA, they must enforce those decisions. And not only in the Irish courts, but elsewhere. 
So Miss Justice Dunn said, um, of particular significance is the almost uh, almost automatic enforcement of enfor enforceability of CETA awards. This is the principal difference between awards the ECH or and CETA tribunals. This takes a CETA award back from the international plane to the domestic legal system. And she said, and this is a crucial point, to my mind, that is why it is necessary to have CETA ratified by the people. So she said explicitly there that there should be a referendum in terms of if CETA is to remain effective in the way it is now. Um, so, so that was the crucial point, and, and that was the majority decision. But as CETA stands, that it has to be ratified by the people if there's that automatic enforcement. And then I think maybe Agnes is going to talk about what the heavy well, could possibly get around it. That's why I was just going to lead on to that, Angus, because there was a sort of comment about there may be a way of changing the legislation without having to go to referendum. I think possibly yeah, politicians so, call it an easy fix. Yeah, Is so it? so that that's what um, Judge Sherrod Hogan said. He's he's one of our, you know, um, even before he was appointed to the Supreme Court, he's one of our most eminent constitutional scholars, and he's been a, a judge in the Court of Appeal. Uh, in the High Court uh, and in the EU previously, so he's really a knowledgeable guy. Um, and I think there was, you know, uh, when complicated judgments from the Supreme Court come out, uh, politicians should probably avoid opening their mouths for a while, because it's actually a lot more nuanced than it seems on the face of it. So what Judge Hogan said was, as it currently stands, CETA cannot be ratified full stop. But he said he sketched out what he said could be a possible method of ratification, which would be amending uh, the Arbitration Act, right? So, without getting too technical, the Arbitration Act is the mechanism whereby uh, a, a judgment made by these CETA courts then comes and has effect in the state. It's the mechanism by which uh, the state could, would then be obliged to actually pony up the cash uh, after the uh, the award comes home. And um, in general, uh, the sorts of there are some limited uh, defenses that a, a country can have to in, enforcing a foreign arbitral award, but they're very limited. So if you could show that there was fraud or something like that in the way that the tribunal decided its case, which is you know going to be almost impossible, then you might be able to say, no, we're not going to enforce that. And to be clear here, just so we understand the scope of what we're talking about, you know, in a, there's a similar ISDS mechanism under the Energy Charter Treaty. And recently, for instance, the, the Dutch government in relation to discontinuing fossil fuels in the Netherlands got hit with a, a, a judgment under the Energy Charter Treaty in the realm, I think it was in excess of 2 billion euros. So when you think about the financial implications of this, they're certainly non-trivial. And, and it's certainly something we need to think about before we decide, well, this is something we want or, or, or we don't want. So what Judge Hogan said is, as it stands, we can't do it. But if the Arbitration Act could be amended in such a way that it provided a defense of what he, what he termed, which would allow the state to refuse enforcement of a CETA award where uh, the CETA award would impinge on the constitutional identity of the state, then that amendment might allow for the ratification of CETA. And of course, Michal Martin and Neil Barker came out and said, nothing to see here, we'll fix it by ordinary legislation. But not being lawyers and not knowing anything about the specifics of CETA, um, I mean, uh, Leo was on record as saying he thought the case had no chance of, uh, of success, shows what he knows. But um, it, it's more complicated than, than it appears. So the best analogy I could draw with, for you is, yeah, you could do this amendment to the Arbitration Act, but that would then immediately bring the state and its laws into contravention with the terms of the CETA agreement itself, which, which specifically sets out uh, the two codes of law under which uh, judgments must be enforced. And they provide, as I say, for uh, as Duncan was saying, for almost automatic enforcement. And these defenses that Judge Hogan were, was talking about as a possibility are completely inconsistent with the CETA agreement. So, in order to pass that legislation, you could do it, but it would be like 
the UK government unilaterally amending the protocol on Northern Ireland by passing legislation in Westminster. Yeah, sure, they can do it, but they're going to annoy all the other parties to the treaty, uh, and it's going to cause a big political problem at an international level. So insofar as the judgment or the way it was reported says there's an easy fix, there certainly isn't one. Um, it's, <laughs> it's worth noting as well um, that, um, you know, uh, CETA took a long, long time to negotiate. I mean, uh, the agreement itself, I think, was signed off uh, in 2014. And even after that, they were agreeing further annexes. They created a thing called a joint interpretive instrument, which is supposed to guide our interpretation of, uh, of CETA. And indeed, in the last 12 months, um, and this was a feature in the case, um, even after the, we, all the arguments were closed, we had to put in more information because the German government has now raised fresh concerns and they're looking to uh, negotiate uh, further sort of supplementary changes to CETA because it's causing great concern there. So yeah, you can pass the legislation, but that's really going to annoy the other, 20, the other 26 EU member states and Canada and will require renegotiation at an international level. So actually, probably when the Office of the Attorney General, whose job it is to advise the government on what they need to do after the judgment, reflects on this, I suspect that they're going to come back and say much the easiest way to, to sidestep all these difficulties is just to have a referendum. Now, of course, we know that the state does not want a referendum because they almost certainly lose it. Um, because I don't know about you guys, but the idea of secret courts for uh, for corporations uh, and just for corporations uh, uh, doesn't seem like a great idea. So uh, that's where we are. So the, the judgment is a, a lot more nuanced. It's a lot more complex um, than what's going on. Like uh, it's worth noting, for instance, that you know the chief justice was against us, uh, and we still won the case by four three. We had. As something was saying, we had two main arguments that we were making. One was that the independence or the sovereignty of the Irish court system was, a, a, you know, impinged by the creation of these courts. And secondly, we said that effectively there would be a, a chilling effect on the legislator, the, the legislature, because they might be afraid to make laws uh, on the theory that they could be sued in seat of court. So effectively, the result was we lost on the chilling effect, we lost on the legislation, but we won on uh, the court's issue uh, and the Supreme Court found by a majority of four to three that as currently constituted CETA infringes on the, the sovereign right of uh, the Irish state to decide all claims against itself. So the basic idea is if you want to sue the state you've got to sue the state in the state's courts uh, and, and what this judgment has done is protected that um, for now. Um, it may be the case that they'll try the ordinary legislation route, but as I say, that has other problems and it may be, they may decide to push ahead with that, but, and then there may be scope for <laughs> further challenges and further cases. Uh, I wouldn't like to hazard whether Deputy Costello would be willing to <laughs> put his, put his, um, put his, uh, I'm His sorry. house on the line <laughs> again for that. Yeah, and, and it's, a, and marriage, it's, it's important um, to say that as well. That you know, um, the we had four days of hearing before the High Court. We had four days uh, of hearing before the Supreme Court. We had Jared Hogan say, as Donica said, that this was one of the most important cases in the hundred-year history of the Supreme Court. Um, and it's worth bearing that in mind because you know certain politicians were very hostile to this um, and now they've been uh, they've been proved wrong and Patrick's been vindicated by the highest court in the land. But I think what's also important is that the constitution and the integrity of our courts has been vindicated Absolutely. by the highest court in the land. And that's, a, you know, CETA contains a political choice to undermine our own courts in the favour of investor courts, which I don't think is a good thing to do. And I don't think anyone else in this room agrees with that. Can I ask you, Patrick, like, if there were the investor courts here, like, what's the makeup of them in other countries? How are they made up? Like, what cases have they brought? Like, what, what happens? It sounds like a, a logically bad idea, stupendously bad idea, but what's happening in other countries where there have been 
well, one you. of the one of the cases the guys raised while on their feet in the courts was the case the Eco Oro uh, v Colombia, where Colombia designated a large area as a nature reserve, uh, and Eco Oro Mining said, "Yeah, but we have a mining license for there." And oh, but they want that mining license. Yeah. I do, yeah, but they went to ISDS um, to to an investor court, and they said, and the investor court said, you know, yes, Colombia is free to regulate the language in CETA. You're totally free to regulate. You just need to pay this mining company billions in compensation for their lost ability <laughs> yeah. to mine in a nature yeah. reserve. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I think there, 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 that's a very important thing to, to look at. Uh, we've mentioned the Energy Charter Treaty. Australia, when it was trying to pass a lot of laws around tobacco, was sued repeatedly by Philip Morris. You know, and this is why the new Australian government has created a unit in their Department of Foreign Affairs to withdraw themselves from as many of these investors. It's not just environmental issues, yeah, it, yeah. it's a wider sort of scoping problem, isn't it? But the, yeah, because there has been, like there's been a long history of investor courts. Generally, they were a post-colonial structure used to allow advanced industries, industrial countries to continue to exert control and influence on the developing world, on the global south, even with the, in, the, in the absence of the colonial power structures. And that's kind of where they've come from. So they're very common in the developing world as a way of controlling things, as a way of exerting that influence still. So, and, the, and when, as they expand, that's what you see again and again and again. It's about exerting uh, uh, essentially colonial control over yeah. governments in favor of multinationals. The question is why are we, if we want to invite that, I suppose here, but just something that comes to mind and you're actually saying, Angus, it took, it was such a complex, process to negotiate the trade part of CETA. Is it possible or is it an option where one stands or like to ratify now and sort of worry about those details later? Or is this is this the crunch time? No. So like this is really the crunch time. Like one of the elements that we haven't touched upon yet is the, the multilateral investment tribunal. And what it that is is stated in CETA that all the parties to CETA must work towards effectively expanding CETA to cover any investment uh, treaty so that not only will CETA be covered but also say TTIP or deals with Singapore or China or whoever so any foreign investor not just Canadian investors will be able to sue uh, and a key element of that is that if we do actually ratify CETA so at the moment we have the right to say no to CETA but once we ratify we lose that right because CETA would become a part of EU law and we'd be obliged to follow it. And that has two big implications. First of all, we have to toe the line creating the multilateral investment tribunal. And secondly, <coughs> the legislative fix simply doesn't work because you can't have legislation at a national level to say you won't comply with CETA because CETA is EU law. So you might have create legislation, which would, the Supreme Court says, might allow for ratification, but then immediately to protect the constitution, then immediately upon ratification, that law will be struck down. So the constitution is left utterly open. Clear. The more I hear about this, the more there's layers yeah, and layers. Yeah, yeah. It's like an onion. Um, I'm just going to, a couple of questions that came in um, from people online. So I'm just going to take those now and I'm then just going to open up to the floor because this is in, it's incredibly complex. I'm sure there's loads of questions as you're listening to the detailed explanations up here. Um, and we'll just open up. But I'm just going to ask a couple that has come in, one from Shane. And Shane asked, has anyone seen the draft text agreed by Germany and the European Commission in August to clarify CETA's investor court system? And do we know yet if that would substantially change the ICS? And Shane says, it doesn't seem to make sense for Ireland to move forward with ratification until we know exactly what we're signing up for. Um, short answer is yes, we have seen that. Um, I can share it perhaps later because it's... Uh, a long document it's very technical and i can't uh, i can't speak to it right now yeah. um but we have seen that and that's so the germans have agreed that that's going to the eu council for agreement as a common eu position and from there we'll go to the CETA joint committee um there are implications there i i i think it has been ratified by or it's i don't know where we're at in that process it's the short yeah. answer. So I, I think I'm, I, 
I think we're only at the first step. So it's basically just Germany yeah. proposing it. Uh, so if, if Patrick brings up something that we haven't mentioned yet, which is the CETA Joint Committee, which is an organization which oversees CETA and interprets CETA and can actually create further investor protection rules. Uh, and that's made up of the uh, Trade Minister from Canada and the Trade Commissioner from the EU. So while Ireland can feed into that, we wouldn't have a veto on what they say, so they can make further rules. Make further decisions. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, where it is in that process, I, I've seen it to summarize. It, it's a lot of nice words about protecting uh, regulations that are aimed to put in place measures for the Paris Agreement, but it's not really, doesn't go nearly far enough to prevent the compensation okay. and that chilling effect. That we but there is also the other angle with it that. Well, long before my case, there was a case at the European, the Courts of Justice of the European Union, um, where the Courts of Justice of the European Union made some assumptions about CETA and then said, based on these assumptions, it is uh, in line with European Union law and member states are free to ratify it. This German process will actually kind of question or challenge some of those assumptions. This is obviously a very simplistic version, but if the CETA Joint Committee comes back and says, no, 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 that's not what we think it means, then those assumptions that form the basis of the decision of the Courts of Justice of the European Union don't apply, which kind of puts that case really on very shaky grounds and opens up the possibility of, first of all, CETA actually being outside of European Union law and a second challenge to be taken at Brussels. So the road ahead for CETA is, is bumpy, even before, regardless of whatever happens here, the road ahead is bumpy, particularly because of this German process may expose the weaknesses in those original assumptions in the Courts of Justice of the European Union. I think it's also, just to speak to the last part of that question about whether or not this is something um, we should proceed with or not, I think the point is, um, you know, ICS is a lemon. It's not going to change if we shine it up a bit or make it look a bit nicer. Um, the principle of the thing is, is wrong. The principle of the thing is that issue. Um, you, why on earth would anyone give special status uh, to corporations to sue governments outside their own courts? The principle of the thing is that issue. And if you, we had to do a lot of deep dives into the history of this. I mean, the first of these types of agreements were dreamt up as a substitute for gunboat diplomacy in the 1920s. So when the British Empire, et cetera, couldn't send in their, gun their gunboats anymore to threaten local countries if there were you know, trade deals being reneged upon, this was dreamt up as a, as a replacement. And somehow, you know, we've now decided um, that um, we want to apply this to ourselves as well. I mean, it obviously was never good to be using it as a lever to, um, you know, enforce your will on countries from the developing world. Uh, and it's bad enough when you're doing that. And now the political project is to apply it to ourselves. Is, but it, is just on a very mercenary level, is there any benefit to Ireland if we brought this in to us as a nation? No, like, it, it might help Khmer resources, but it's not going to help the people of Khmer. Yeah. It might help total oil. But it's not going to help the people. Exactly. I think that's, that's the question. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, the reason this is probably wanted is because Ireland has a really well developed and functioning legal system, and so does Canada. The accession, the accession states in the former communist countries, not so much. We know Poland has been in trouble recently about the manner in which it appoints its judgments. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think the rationale behind this from the EU is a sop to Canadian investors. Look, you don't have to go for the Polish courts or the Romanian courts, you get these special courts. But quite frankly, I think that's an argument to improve the rule of law across the European Union, mm -hmm. not uh, uh, to give <coughs> corporations a free pass to, to, to sue us. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that's worth noting is that the mood music in terms of ISDS has been changing a lot in the last few years. Um, Germany, the Netherlands, France have all opted recently to pull out of the Energy Charter Treaty, which Ireland is a signatory to as well, but we've never been sued on, uh, but has a similar ISDS mechanism. The European Parliament just voted in the last week that the European Union should withdraw from the Energy Charter Treaty. Now, unfortunately, because 
Parliament doesn't have the foreign policy function in European Union law, that vote has no impact, but it does say that the political mood music is changing. It's worth noting, for instance, that NAFTA between Canada, the US and Mexico also used to contain an ISDS mechanism, and now the replacement agreement for uh, NAFTA has removed that. So there's a recognition across the international sphere that these types of agreements are not the way forward. So, uh, you know, I think what we need to do is, is, is galvanize that support and really put it up to the parliamentary party to be strong on this. Because let's be frank here, people, the, the policy position of this party is that the ratification of CETA is, uh, sh should, should not be allowed, should not be permitted. And yet our party leader has had, you know, a Damascus-like conversion you can see the video clips of him criticizing CETA only a few years ago. Now he thinks it's the best thing since sliced bread. So we as party members need to put it up to the parliamentary yeah. party, need to put it up to the leadership and test them on their position and make sure that we do um, you know, protect the interests of the state. Because one of the things that's really important to bear in mind, think about the most pressing social issue that we have in Ireland right now is housing. There are huge numbers of Canadian real estate investment trusts. If CETA comes in and we want to bring in rent regulation, we will be sued and we will probably lose for uh, lose that with those sorts of cases. So these are very real concrete effects that we can foresee, quite apart from any of the huge changes to our society that we're going to have to make uh, to affect um, change in terms of dealing with the climate crisis. There are other far more concrete and proximate ways in which the government freedom of action could be hamstrung if investor courts become the norm and um, that's very much the european union's project and we as citizens uh, uh, as people who are involved in political life need to do our best to exert pressure to make sure uh, that these types of mechanisms are condemned to the dustbin of history where they belong <laughs> I, 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 absolutely, I, absolutely, I absolutely do agree that they need to be sent to dustbin, but I, I think I, sh I will put up a slight defence for the party's position uh, at a bit of level, and that is that there had been this decision of the ECJ that said that there can't be compensation uh, whenever a uh, decision is taken on for legitimate reasons, I, well, as a matter of international law. But th as Cosi said, those, uh, Patrick said, those assumptions are wrong as a matter of international law. So if you look at the ECJ judgment, you could understandably think that this isn't that big a problem. But the, the, first of all, I think it's wrong as a matter of international law, but there's absolutely no doubt that there's no certainty. And one of the real problems with CETA is that you can't pull out of it. Because if you do pull out of it, CETA protections and the CETA tribunal still applies for another 20 years, another generation of environmental damage. But see, am I just one? So, as part of the text that Germany is proposing, they're confirming that there'll be a review of the investor protection rules in five years. So they recognize that there's problems there and there's uncertainty there. And yet they're tying us to it for another 20 years. It's, 20. Back, it's back to that point of now is the crunch time to decide yeah. whether or not. But just to be clear, it, it is 20 years to exit, but the European Union is the member of CETA not Ireland. So it's the European Union en masse that has to make the decision to leave. And that would take 20 years. So then there's the political, the time it takes to convince all the member states to leave, or we leave the European Union, which I don't think anyone is suggesting. Yeah. But that's the reality of it, that, you know, unless we're willing to take that, you know, a, a apocalyptic step or nuclear step, then we'll be locked into this as long as it is the common EU position. To be in. Yeah. And so you said it's, it's the layers yeah. of the onion, the more you start picking yeah. at this, the yeah. more complex. And just one other thing to pick up there's still likely to be constitutional challenges uh, in Germany, you know, so there's there's more layers to pick up. Yeah. Well. So there was a similar treaty with, uh, although there was a similar treaty with uh, Singapore, and that went before the uh, European courts, and they said that needs ratification for member states. So what the EU simply did there was they split trade and investment. So the trade agreement with Singapore is in place, and they've just put uh, the investment part mm -hmm. on the on, into the back shelf yeah. under touch under the filing cabinet somewhere because no one's ratified. Yeah. So you can do all the trade elements without the need for these. We've got the trade elements in place. <clears throat> Excuse me at the moment. 
Um, I'm just going to, I'm conscious of time because there is another session coming in straight after us. So I just want to go to the audience quickly. I saw, sorry, just with the yeah. blue headband there, I saw you had to go first. I just wanted to ask a question maybe you can answer in relation to what is called the regulatory impact assessment. The Department of Trade and Enterprise raised with the document. And my question to you is that what is next going to happen? Because I know that the Oraxas have to have this vote, that this vote has to happen. With all of this, will, will be a new, so after this uh, judgment, would they need to have a new assessment? Because the assessment, assessment was done last year, right? By the Department of Trade. Yeah, I, I think we're a long way from any of that kind of stuff becoming real. I think they, they're, they're, they're going to need to go to Europe, they're going to need to go to Canada and seek amendments to see the boring that just to float. There we go. Close there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, Cleanna Kimber. Um, I just want to personally commend um, Patrick. Yeah. I think it's important that everybody realizes the bravery that has to here. I'm, I'm yeah. a barrister myself. I mean, Patrick had to had to run this against the party, run it uh, with his own personal money at risk, and you know, but very brave and courageous. Mm -hmm extraordinarily so and the legal team worked almost every day for several years with little or no prospect of payment and they have to earn their livings too and you know the, the, the bravery the courage the commitment uh, we're, it's absolutely wonderful you know as a slight rider to that i might also say that this maybe reminds us the green party that, that legal issues are very important to the environment and we cannot stand off and leave the legal stuff to housing, to the you know, Minister for Housing, to the Minister for Justice, you know, as a party, we've got to, Kenzie Lawrence and the party, we've got to take advice from our own people um, and have the courage to engage. There's lots more legal challenges going on, but lots more problems that the party is going to be bound up in, particularly around this housing crisis. Huge, uh, huge plans now are put to try and cut back access to courts and environmental justice. That'll be the next fight. But, I really, I cannot stress enough, if, if you're in this game, I know how much, how much they put forward personally in order to bring this along, and I, I'm very proud of them all. Can I? Uh, just to respond, I say thank you very much for that and for everyone, particularly coming from the chair of the Bar Climate Association. Uh, for everyone who doesn't know, Cian is the chair of the Bar Climate Association, I think I've got that right. Uh, fighting for climate justice on the inside. Uh, and I think your work on the environmental court and the work of the Climate Bar Association is incredibly important. And uh, looking at Oliver here should be another uh, Just Transition Green event very soon. Um, because I think the access to justice piece, like I was very lucky and we can drill down into the access to justice and talk for a long time on that. I would also like to just briefly thank the rest of the legal team who aren't here. Dunica and Angus are members. And the others aren't, so they better things to do on their, uh, on their weekend. But uh, Eileen Barrington, senior counsel, Siobhan Phelan, senior counsel, who in the middle of the trial was made a judge and has had some excellent judgments, I must say. Um, <laughs> John Rogers, senior counsel, and uh, Kieran Lewis, senior counsel as well. So, you know, I, they need to be said thanked as well. Okay, so I mean, it, it's very obvious there's a huge issue constitutionally for us as a country, and no doubt about that. What I'm thinking about now, Patrick, because you were the lone wolf, and with this video, I know you have obviously supporters in the party and other representatives who are behind you. But what's going to be the political fallout, do you think, of this for us as a party, but also for what's just happening in government? What's your, your view on where this is going, really? Um, look, I think, as the guys say, it, this is an incredibly complicated thing, and the, 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 I think the political, the big, the biggest challenge now, or the biggest headache is going to be the attorney generals to try and find a way to do this. We know that Leo Racker is very clear that he wants to really ratify this treaty. Um, he said that before, he said that after, he's very supportive of trade. I would argue the trade elements are already in place as we've spoken about but the biggest headache first and foremost is with the attorney general and i think he's going to need to take time to work out how to do this and um, and while he's doing that we need to be having the conversation should we be doing this and i think using this time to reflect do we even want to be part of an investor court 
as we've been speaking about here, the mood music is changing, you know, and I think there are many challenges across the European Union. So it's not just here, it's not just a political challenge here. I think the Germany, there's still concerns. There's still a constitutional challenge there. Um, I think the Cypriots have rejected it in their parliament. Uh, France is, is holding back on ratifying it. You know, so there are lots of European politics and international politics behind going on as well. So I think we need to be working with, in terms of politics, we need to be working with the European Green Party and our allies and colleagues in other countries to deal with all of those issues. I think ultimately, I think there's going to be so many political issues at a European level that we need to take our time and not do anything until those are sorted out. Because there's no point anybody having a fight or spending political capital, whether it's Fine Gael or the Greens, on something that could be overturned by the Courts Justice of the European Union. So we need to stop and slow down and let the European stuff pan out. While also we can, and while doing that, the AG can think about how we can argue and campaign on should. But certainly we should stop and slow down and let the European stuff sort out. There's um, somebody at the back over there. Sorry, um, the girl with the blonde hair, I think, is it? No, the hand has gone down. I'll go over it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Dominic Donnelly, Cork Greens. Um, I just have a question, I suppose, more for Donica, probably, in that is there anything of interest in the judgments of the three judges who? Shall we say went the wrong way on this? Is there any? Is there, you know, where legally is that coming from? Well, I think. Um, is that political? No, I would I, I say it's political. Um, the, the chief justice and and, and everyone else, they're they've got a job for life. They don't have to count out anyone. They, um, and they are the judges of, of the highest caliber. And there's no doubt, and we're extremely lucky that, that we have them. It's obviously a huge complicated area, so um, I, I don't think there's any merit to say that it's a political decision. Um, I think what he did, Chief Justice said, and it's a long judgment, I haven't got through it all yet, but he, he drew a direct equivalence to the ECHR and how the executive is given significant power by the Oireachtas through the people who vote, who vote for the Oireachtas, um, members of the Oireachtas, and that the executive is given the power to do treaties, and they've done the same for the ECHR. And he was saying that there really is a very direct equivalence between the ECHR and CETA. So the ECHR, the Convention of Human Rights, ostensibly makes laws which apply in Ireland. And there's similarly a court system which can award damages. But the analogy I'd give you is the difference between, so an ECHR award of damages isn't enforceable in the Irish courts and certainly not any other courts. So it's, it's something akin to your an invitation to your brother's wedding. If you should go, it's going to cause family strife if you don't go. But nobody's going to force you along to make small talk with Uncle Mary or Aunt Mary or uh, anyone else. Whereas with the seat of judgment, you will be forced to comply. Your assets will be frozen. If you block that judgment, you will go to jail. So the, the Chief Justice did make that analogy. I think it's wrong. I think the majority was wrong. It's kind of like having to go to your own wedding. <laughs> <laughs> Just to stretch the game. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have more questions there at the back, at the very, very back. Hi there, uh, Michael from the Loud Group. I just want to know, um, speaking of a new member, what are the best things we can do? Like, the people here in this room can be doing this sort of live chat or within the party. Uh, um, I don't know if you want to answer that, but so things things that as members we can do. Well, I think like part of it is to keep having those conversations in your own groups with your own elected reps about should we be doing this. There are lots of also like myself and NASA had a roundtable meeting with uh, about twenty different NGOs, um, ranging from students' union groups, Extinction Rebellion the Irish Environmental Network, but there was almost also the, the Climate Health Alliance, groups like that. You know, the Irish Heart Foundation uh, and groups like this are concerned about CETA because of its potential impact on health regulation. Um, <coughs> so I think the thing to do now is to uh, have those internal conversations, keep talking, but also to 
you know, find allies and build allies outside and try and start that conversation in a wider uh, uh, society as well about should we be doing this? While, while the question of how is being dealt with by the AG, as I say, and while the European issue is being worked out, that's the important question. I'm, you know, asking people, do you want to sign up to a secretive court that uh, prioritises multinational companies? Yeah, and it might be something that, not just within our own party, but Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael, do they really backbenchers? Do, do they understand it? No. Yeah. And if they did understand it, are they going to spend political capital on doing it? Like in your, I think Fergus O'Day might be your local Fianna Gael GD. I know certainly people around him are very against CETA. I don't know his position particularly. But if you find if there's division within Fianna Gael and Fianna Fáil, and there will be if the issues are fully understood, people like not just the climate people, but IFA are against CETA. So there's plenty of people who will be against CETA. So I think the more awareness, not just within the party, but externally as well. And the IFA are very concerned about Mercosur. And my 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 experience talking to Fianna Fáil backbenchers is they're very concerned about Mercosur. So if CETA is seen as a door to that, you know, so it's that, as Dunning says, as conversations with Fergus, not go to Fergus's uh, uh, constituency clinics, you know, and it's not about be having a row with them at this stage. It's it's that conversation and building allies and and reflecting on should we do this? What are the costs if we do? I'm just going to check, Oliver, how much time do we have left? 15 minutes. Perfect. Uh, yeah, the, uh, 10. Okay. Oh, yes, yes. You, I know we've been waiting for a minute. I understand the idea about uh, waiting for things to work out, but to win hearts and minds, it's not about just what we're against, well done, just what we're for. So are we suggesting something like a European court which would give, um, where the investors would get fair treatment? Well, I would argue that the Irish courts and the courts justice, the European Union, are those courts. Yeah. The national courts established with transparency and democracy under Bunrock and Heron are the courts that will give investors fair treatment. There's the, and I don't see anything in our constitution or in the practice of our courts that says anyone who brings a petition won't get fair treatment. Um, so, and then there, I think there is a wider thing, and one or two of the groups raised this at that round table myself and NASA had, that like you say, it's not just enough to say what we're against, but I think the time is now to start trying to articulate and work out what exactly a progressive, a fair trade policy looks like, a progressive policy trade, a progressive trade policy looks like. So, so I think there's that piece of work that needs to be done as well. I mean, I think it's important to add as well about this, like, um, I think Michal Martin was quoted, I think, in the Irish Times during the week saying, I don't understand why anyone would be against a free trade agreement. And the thing is, we're not against a free trade agreement. We currently enjoy the benefits of free trade with Canada under the provisional application of CETA, and nobody has an issue with free trade agreements. The issue is with this alternative forum. Uh, and we have an, many, many trade agreements with many parts of the world which don't have this. And there's no necessity uh, for, for this type of institution. I think we're all agreed that we should be, you know, have, having free trade agreements and, and, and trading with other parts of the world and, and, you know, having that exchange of, of culture and business practice and so forth and learning from one another. What we just don't need is special courts for multinationals. And that's where I think people need to, when we're having our conversations, is to reframe or go back to that. I see Blahin, and I know there's two people over here that are waiting to get in. Blahin, do you want to go? Yeah, just to say, um, this has been a very divisive issue in the Green Party. And Patrick, you stood up with your head above the parapet and you've been very successful. And yes, we have given you great uh, congratulations for that because it's a very great thing to do. Going forward, we need to try and prevent that continuous division because it's divide and conquer. So uh, have you got thoughts about how we can do that? And I think what Elizabeth is so important, people are not separating CETA from the invest reports. And we have to highlight that we are not against, nobody's against free trade. It's against having a, we either have a democracy or we don't. Why should we have a democracy based on wealthy people having a special court to allow them to do whatever they want to do? And I think that's the angle we need to take. It's a fairness for everybody, not just for big business. I'm just going to bring in, I mean, Patrick, you can respond to both of them. I know you've been waiting in the middle there. Sorry, your hands. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, 
both transparency, I'm here as an observer. My name is Selena Donnelly, I'm a speaker from Chokra. Um, Chokra has been deeply concerned and engaged with all political parties across the system in relation to um, ISDS, the reformed ICF um, and corporate cor courts, which is essentially what they are. Just to the question, um, I think the reasons are clear. Um, the threat of litigation that's hung over a number of countries where we're operational working with local civil society that are trying to do progressive things. And the threat of litigation for multinationals in those contexts has prohibited um, particularly climate action. And, and it's right across the whole scale of kind of um, issues um, that communities are trying to work on. Um, but just to the point about what are we for, <laughs> um, the disparity in um, attention on access to justice issues where corporates already have, as you say, very good access to the large court system, needs to a whole range of it. But yet, at the, at the same time as the EU has been pushing this agenda around um, including the ISDS in these agreements, they've been blocking action um, at the UN forums on like building a globally binding treaty um, that would allow access to justice for communities that have been worst affected by violations perpetrated by multinationals um, uh, and Unfortunately, we're replete with examples of that, and there isn't that kind of equity and treatment in terms of access to justice. So uh, we would continue to be supportive of the calls for no ratification of um, agreements that have ISDS reformed or otherwise. And I think it's really important to note, as you have, the change in what's happening with the EPT Energy Charter Treaty at the moment. It doesn't really seem to make, there's not a coherence, I would say, uh, in approach. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your comments on that. I'm sorry, I'm going to go. I know you've been waiting to get in. If I can maybe bring you in, there might be one more and then after you, and I think we'll have to wrap it up then. Go ahead. Um, yeah, well, just to echo the, you know, it's great what you what you guys have done. So I just like I just think that's really, really great. And and also to echo what um what the Lady from Chopra said. We should be suing the corporations and not the other way around. Um, you know, where's the where's the rights of communities to sue corporations for human rights abuses for environmental damage? So, you know, those are the, the that's the sort of like things that should be taken to the court. But then a sort of a question then is like with the investor courts, if we're a signatory to the Energy Charter tre Treaty, are we also um liable to be sued tomorrow um under other investor courts? Only the Energy Charter Treaty, um, that wasn't challenged at the time. Uh, we contended in the proceedings and we were asked by the Supreme Court in the proceedings, what was our position on the Energy Charter Treaty? And we say it's unconstitutional in exactly the same way that CETA is. It was never challenged at the time. So, um, you know, it remains to be seen. We haven't been sued under the Energy Charter Treaty, but and given that most of the sort of historic fossil fuel burning um, energy generation capacity in Ireland was in the ownership of the state, it seems unlikely that we would, would be uh, sued, except for potentially uh, on banning smoky coal. And we've seen the slowness of um, the Oireachtas um, to fully extend that ban in fairness. I think Eamon's doing a piece on that, but it's, it's not where we want it to be at. I think, I think there's actually the car gas field of things in the Canadian I would like, so other chances. So. We, if we were to appropriate that, appropriate that, so the windfall tax, which is suggested, would well fall the Yeah, I'm just going to say, I'm just going to take one. There's one last question at the back here, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Michael Ewing here. Just to think about this intervention. Green Party has a pending policy on HIV. A few years ago, there was a very heated discussion around the CETA and the Green Party, which resulted in the two full day events on CETA, which are announced for research. What policy has been set up? What's been working ever since? Produce the policy. Whatever policy is sitting there for me for six months, <coughs> waiting on the outcome of your case, which is brilliant. Uh, so that will be coming to the Policy Council in February for a decision. It's already been for discussion before. So, three parties will have very clear policies on free trade agreements out there. That's, that's really brilliant. So, just as a piece of information. Michael is the head of our Policy Council. Thank you. I was going to give a one last question, but maybe I'll. Yeah. It's, it's the last one. Thing. I'm also a new member to the party, and part of the reason that I haven't been active in the group, obviously, my main aim is to, you know, climate change and mitigation and biodiversity. I have to say it was very 
of footing for someone from probably a middle range political position to come into the party to see the schism. And actually just being here today has totally enlightened me as to the reasons why, but my suggestion would be that you rebrand the way within the party that you discuss this. And you talk about you are pro-trade agreements and you are anti-investor courts. It's a very simple message and I think it could go nationally. And I think that's that's a very important, I utterly agree, because that's the answer uh, to Blahin's question about the division. And it goes back to my question about let's have these conversations. Now is the time when legislatively we can slow things down and let's have these conversations. Let's find out what we're for. It's great to hear that policy is about to come forward. I was going to say what we're for is for the sort of work the Troker is doing. I didn't realize you were there, Selena, <laughs> um, around human rights and business, you know, and that's like that's what we should be for. And yes, it's it, a positive message about what we're for in terms of the tr trade, fair trade. With, without investor courts. I think it's very important for all of us bringing us back together. Um, yes, we are in coalition and that brings its own dynamic to it, but aware of that, I think we can still have very unifying conversations in positive terms in what we're for. I'm going to just wrap up. I think we could stay speaking here for another hour, possibly, because this has been, I know I found it really, really illuminating and just great to hear that sort of depth of technical knowledge and your own experience, Patrick, as well. There's a couple of positive messages just coming online saying congratulations and thanks for having the courage to take this important case and bravo from somebody else to Patrick and his team on this groundbreaking ruling, which has implications not only in Ireland, but internationally. And I think that's a really good note, I think, to wrap this up on. So thank you and thank you all. Thank you.